Hey there, it is 8.58 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's December the 11th in the year that we're told, 2023. Today's brief will be on profits, generally beyond profits. More specifically, the approach and behaviors of actual profits, real profits, truthful, sincere profits of Yahweh, as compared a little bit to lying prophets. Because, you know, there are prophets of, like we would think in, in the English transliterations of Baal, there are lying prophets. There are lying prophets sent by Yahweh to test people. And there's worse than that. So anybody who thinks that they can kick back and that they don't need to be vigilant and make absolutely sure that whoever they're learning from, listening to, whatever they're reading, because you should be doing your own reading and you should be doing it critically. You can't just read something out of enjoyment. None of, nothing virtually. Virtually. Nothing exists that you can read out of enjoyment without paying very close attention to what's the agenda, what's being pushed here, what's the sub-narrative here. Or a lot of books out there, no matter if they're... doesn't matter. doesn't matter if they're fiction, non-fiction, technical, reference. Sometimes their, their narrative is just in your face. And if no one's willing to put in the work to discern what's what, <clears throat> well, then I suppose it's your fault. If you get taken by a false prophet or any other bullshitter. And let's be clear about what a prophet is. A prophet does not have to be specifically somebody claiming that they're giving you future insight. A prophet, more often than not, should be somebody speaking the truth. And it's amazing how many people there are out there. They may not call themselves prophets, but they're occupying the position thereof because they are portending and pretending to give you the truth. And if you're not putting in time or effort, energy, resources to take in or do the work yourself, one or the other, either support, do the work yourself, and you get taken in by one of these people, and you're lied to, and your life is practiced based on lies, that's your fault. That's your fault. Now, a lot of people, of course, they act in ignorance. I acted in ignorance for much of my life. And it took many years of very hard fought struggles to even get to the knowledge that I have now. I did that. I alone. And I've paid the price for a lot of those, those struggles to get here and the, the practices and the lifestyle that I've had to live and the beliefs that I've had to be very firm on. That's how it goes. So there is ignorance, there is nescience. Ignorance is a bad word because the root is to ignore. So ignorance is no excuse, there's nescience. And we all have that programming and that degree of nescience because of the programming or because of what's been kept from us. That's true. That's very true. But at the same time, all of us have had a number of at least points in our life when we have been presented with the truth that we've been able to make a decision whether or not we're positively going to act on that or not. Whether we're positively going to seek that, do the work, make the sacrifices to understand that or to get that. Are we going to put our resources into investing in that or not? 
we all have a number of points in our life where we're given choices like that and many of us tend to stay in ignorance and this time it it is used correctly ignorance because we've ignored those important things in lieu of comforts or just things we want now segueing from that into the prophets the funny thing is about we don't have to talk about just biblical prophets let's talk about anybody trying to tell the truth about something now the truth is oftentimes never an easy thing to tell it's oftentimes not an easy thing to express and more often than not somebody trying to tell the truth in the face of an enormous wall of lies and that's typically somebody telling the absolute truth about a thing they are usually standing in front of an enormous wall of lies and that's regarding just about everything just about everything unless we're talking about what makes a recipe spicy then you're not standing in front of an enormous wall of people lying and saying well it's sh it's actually sugar sugar makes sugar will make your your food taste really spicy and hot okay because that doesn't matter that's why you're not standing in front of it you're going to stand in front of those walls of lies when we're talking about something that matters and typically people who come to a point not at the end but come to a point along the way where they have seen a great amount of proof that convinces them that most of the information on any given subject is a lie they tend to be shocked at first and then they can they keep looking into it because most people are in disbelief because they're not coming looking for that like hey i think such and such popular narrative is a lie so i'm gonna f go find because they would have no reason to think that but once they get to that point a certain point along the way and they realize through a number of pieces of evidence that that thing they thought was the truth is a lie they keep looking into it hopefully keep looking into it and they keep re reconfirming it a number of times and then they come to a point where now they are quite convinced that at least this popular narrative is a lie and that and then they can't just hold it in I don't know what kind of people can actually walk around with the knowledge of the truth about a number of things in the face of so many lies and not have any sort of like any feeling of compassion or, or empathy on the people around them especially the people close to them their family and their friends um, and associates and have a certain amount of compassion for them and think I don't want these people to live in lies now a lot of people try to share what they found that to them appears to be the best evidence is it always the best maybe not always the best evidence and there's probably aspects to it that are still kind of funky because there's so much controlled opposition out there there's so many layers of it permeations of the truth you just got to dig every layer you get to you've got to dig harder and see is there another layer below and i'm sorry but that's the way it is i'm just telling you from experience that's the way it is and everybody who's followed me for a long time knows that i've had to find this out over and over and over and over and over so somebody who reaches that point of truth on a topic they're standing in front of a wall of life just a huge wall of lies it's just them and when they try to share that the problem is the people that they're trying to talk to now they're on the other side of that wall and it's a big wall and they don't know how to get through so a lot of times they might use very cutting language terminologies and approaches because they have to try 
to get through. And the funny thing about that is that the people that I've encountered over the years, personally, and on, and on social media, yeah, mm -hmm. but you never really, really know those people that you encounter kind of day in and day out here, there, and everywhere on social media. You don't know those people. But the people you know, friends, family, associates, um, those people who don't want to hear, they don't, they want to live in ignorance. They want to ignore. They don't care if you're telling them the truth. Because what you're telling them is going to cause discomfort. Now you're going to make me uncomfortable. Now I won't be at leisure in all the things that I love to do, all the things I love to think, all the things I love to believe in. You are going to make me very uncomfortable about those things, so I don't want to listen. So, look, let's say by a certain point in time you've got a few people, <clears throat> or maybe, you know, if it's if you're still locked in a church setting, and this is tough, it was for me, and it, it was for just about everybody I know who has eventually come out of that oppressive mental, spiritual, emotional setting. And you're trying to talk to the people you know, the people who you care about, that you think care about you. And I don't care if it's your, your peers or the pastoral team. I don't even want to go into these people. You get to a certain point where you can have like some dial, maybe they'll listen to some of what you have to say about various things. Doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, some preacher who's way out of line, you're talking about some doctrine that's out of line, whatever. Or, or another topic altogether that doesn't have to do necessarily with the church setting. What you're going to find with with a pretty good amount of people is that when now when they can't argue with the evidence you're presenting them or offer a good I I use the word argue and a lot of people all of a sudden they think of like an argument yelling or something not not that an argument can simply be two conflicting points of view being expressed back and forth, normal tones of voice, even politely. They can't come up with a good counter-argument. So here's one of the very ugly tactics that, that are going to be used. And this is where to know the prophets is so vitally important. They're going to say, maybe... Maybe it's your approach. You know, maybe if you had just a, maybe a little bit softer approach, a little softer handed, you could go a long way with a softer approach. And I had someone in my life, close, real close, for years, that kept using that tactic. It's your approach. I don't want to listen to these things. I don't want to consider these things. I don't want to practice these things. Not based on your evidence. It's your approach. It's your approach. I don't like your approach. That is the last bastion of the person who is so dead set against allowing you and your evidence to ruin their good time, your approach. So let's consider the prophets a little bit. I know this isn't the Let's Consider series. <laughs> We're going to consider the prophets a bit. Not all of them, not all passages, and not all people that are called prophets. Because it's kind of amazing how many people are actually called prophets. And it should really help us define what a prophet is, all the people that are called prophets. Abraham's called a prophet by Yahweh to Pharaoh. So I think 
the way that we think about profits. If we think about somebody telling us about something far into the future that's not, that may be something that someone does who's a prophet, but that is not the mainstay of the prophet's office. What I see is the mainstay over and over and over and over again, a prophet of Yahweh, a truthful, righteous prophet, they tell the truth, they live the truth, they obey Yahweh to their best ability. And not everybody had perfect knowledge, not everyone had a perfect ability uh, or knowledge of the law at all times. I think it has come and gone a bit, probably not nearly as much as it has in the last century or so since we've been under this current regime, which is nothing but ruling through lies and deceptions about everything. And remember, Yahweh's the one who put them in control. It's not going to be easy to get to the truth these days. You're not going to get to the truth by sitting back, relaxing, getting what you want, getting your pleasures, putting your resources into soft, comfortable things, you're not going to get it. And you're not going to get it from me. And that's why this episode is behind a paywall. You're not going to get it from me. I've put in the work. I've paid the price. So I've got all this knowledge now. You can have some. Some I still offer for free, but the majority of it is behind a paywall. There's a good reason for that. But let's start. Let's start by talking about bad prophets. Let's start by talking about lying prophets, and we'll give a, a good example because there are lying prophets. Remember, there's prophets who are truthful, sincere, righteous. There are prophets who are lying prophets, who are sent specifically, specifically sent by Yahweh, to test people, to test people. And we'll see another example of this. We're not just going to see it in the law in Deuteronomy. We're going to see at least one example of this. So a great passage to start with is Deuteronomy chapter 13, starting in verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, wherefore he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go now after other gods which you have not known, let us serve them. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh, your God, Alaik, your God, proveth you. What is, he tests you. He's testing you. To know whether you love Yahweh, Alaik, with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after Yahweh, Alaik, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and you shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death. Because he's spoken to turn you away from Yahweh, your God, Alik, which brought you forth from the land of Mitzram and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, which most of you are still in, and a lot of you don't even know it. I kind of wonder if very little of my slave gear that I designed so that I can make a few extra shekels hasn't really sold because people don't want slave gear on their shirt admitting that they're a slave. You are a slave. Unless you are some sort of enemy agent listening to this, you're a slave. The biggest wrong to this, if I could call it a wrong, I don't know if it's a wrong, I guess, but the biggest component that's so unfortunate is that most of you don't realize intimately, not you heard it and you're like, yeah, yeah, I guess. 
intimately realize, intimately understand what abject slaves you are. And the reason a lot of you don't, in part, is because a lot of you have been de-educated. That's true. That's nescience. It's not your fault. A lot of you have ignored a lot of things that you never should have ignored. That's your fault. I'm at fault too. I did it over the years. I ignored the warning signs of Christianity that it was way off years ago. I paid the price for that in the retardation of my education for years. So not all of this is your fault. Some of it is. But you not knowing you're a slave, in part, probably a little of both, but a lot of it has to do with you not understanding, because I don't fully understand it either. I'm going to admit it to you. But I know enough to know that there's something radically wrong with what we're taught about the economy and resources and money and what we make as far as money and what our property and holdings are. We're completely de-educated about that. However, if we were to take the time to educate ourselves not believing everything we're told, we'd start coming to a better understanding of what total slaves that we are. And Yahweh said to some of our forefathers, and whether or not you're an Israelite, that's not what's necessarily important here. But what's important in the Old Testament is that we have this example of Israel to look at to learn from. Anyone can choose to serve and follow Yahweh, whether they're an Israelite or not. If I was a Moabite, I would still make that decision and do it with all my mind, my heart, and my body to the best of my ability. So if I talk about Israel, we, or anything else, I'm not telling you I have no proof of what I am. None. Zero. Other than the fact that I am part of the slave class and I do have a glass ceiling. But there could be a lot of you that do that aren't necessarily Israelites. Even the, even the tribes spoken of in Psalms that conspired against Judah and Israel over the years, their descendants could have a glass ceiling they don't even know about. Because don't think that the, the rulers, the, the kingdoms, the clans, the tribes that took over this place a century or more ago didn't have a plan amongst themselves, a little inner circle, about over the generations screwing the children of the people who screwed Israel and Judah out of what inheritance they had. We can see it in our own time. I'll bet you. I'll bet you. We can see it in our own time. How's that? We can see how local farmers are being beat out by the big, big, big farms, big commercial farms. We can see how local businesses are being pushed out by the big, big box store businesses. Who do you think own, owns those? Some lucky guy? Sam Walton? Come on. The signs are there. <sighs> but that's the deal. If a prophet comes along, I don't care if he comes along with signs and wonders. I don't care if you think, this guy's got <clears throat> such great content. Man. I love this stuff. These he puts his his videos are so great. His blog is so cool. Is he giving you everything he can as far as the truth goes in every possible way? He or she. He or she. I'm not limiting this just to he. There's prophetesses. Not many. There's some. There are. He or she. That's important. Because Yahweh says. He's giving them the ability to give you signs, wonders, to tickle your pleasure centers in your brain. He's giving them that ability. He's giving them power. Just like he gives any rulers of the world, no matter how oppressive, he gives them power too. The people ruling the world right now, he gave them power. And they still are in power because of him. Think it's unfair? Talk to him. Put in some work. He sends the false prophets. 
Now, he doesn't make these people selfish and want to lie to you and want to lead you after other gods, which pretty much always has something to do with them benefiting. Always. 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 But the false prophet's not going to come to you with harsh words. They're going to come to you with good words. They're going to tell you about how you're not so bad. You do your best. You do your best. If people out there are being too hard on you, well, you know what? That's not okay. Because you do your best. And if they can't understand that and appreciate you, well, pfft, there's then there's something wrong with them. Because you're okay. You're just trying to get by, that's all. And if you waste all the time that you're not doing your slave job or, or sleeping or slaving to your wife or whoever, maybe your husband, look, I'm not, this isn't entirely from a male, it is from a male perspective, but it's not like a misogynistic perspective. I'm just trying to keep it a little bit real. But if you, if the, if you waste all that other time entertaining yourself and relaxing and eat your favorite foods and going out and seeing, hey, look, it's a waterfall. They're going to tell you, well, hey, look, your life's tough enough, man. You, you deserve, you deserve a little this, that, and the other. Come on, don't be so hard on yourself. That's what the false prophet's going to tell you. It's exactly what they're going to tell you. And they're going to mislead you. They're going to find ways to mislead you. And if you're not sharp enough, if you're not being responsible enough, in some way, give something. Give your time. Give your energy. Give your resources. Somehow, some way. If you're not being responsible, that's your fault. If you're being deceived by false prophets, it's your fault. So there you go. There's our false prophets. And they are going to come to you with nice, sweet words, and we'll see that. But how about real prophets? What's their approach? Let's start out with a relatively benign, not a real harsh one, okay? Not a real harsh one, except for Baruch. But we'll go to Judges chapter 4, Deborah. Deborah was a prophetess. She was a judge of Israel at the time. Prophetess, judge of Israel. And the text makes it clear that she was the wife of Lapidoth. She was the wife of Lapidoth. So you can bet if she was a prophetess and a judge of Israel, she still obeyed her husband. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't the judge of Israel. She was. But you can rest assured if the text is telling you that she's the wife of somebody, that's meaningful. However, what happens in the time of Deborah is that this king and his captain, Sisera, are coming against Israel and they're posing a serious threat. And so Deborah calls to this Barak, who is probably a, a well-known man of action, and I'm not going to get into the background of that, but we'll just go into the back and forth between Deborah and Barak. Deborah, a prophetess. So she's already got a reputation by this point. She didn't come out of nowhere. She's established. She tells Barak that he's going to go up against Sisera. They call a number of armies of Israel to come and join him. Okay? He's going to go in against Jabin, this king, and his captain Sisera. Now, she tells him, go, you're going to go and fight with him. And in Judges 4, 8, it says, And Barak said to her, If you'll go with me, then I'll go. But if you'll not go with me, then I will not go. So a prophetess, an established prophetess, tells him to go. Yahweh is going to give him the battle. He wouldn't send him. He says, well, I'll go if you go with me. So in verse 9 it says, And she said, I will surely go with you, notwithstanding the journey that you take shall not be for your honor. 
for Yahweh shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Sure, I'll, I'll go with you, Barak, because my word being an established prophetess, it's not enough for you. You need your little idol with you. So I'll, yeah, I'll go with you. But here's the thing. You're not going to get all that glory. And I know Gideon hasn't arisen yet. So John will insert this. Not like Gideon got. The honor Gideon got when he went. Yeah, Gideon asked for that fleece a few times, but he went. Gideon seemed to start out a pretty meek maybe even a little bit, I hate to use the word, well, let's say afraid. But he went and he did, and he did some hard things, Gideon, not just against the Midianites, against his own people. He had to first off start by dealing with his own people, which is usually harder, as some know. She says, yeah, I'll, you know, pfft. The word of Yahweh through me isn't good enough for you. I'll go with you, but you know, you're you're not going to be honored because Yahweh is going to give that honor into the hand of a woman. <laughs> Okie dokie then. Now that approach of hers didn't seem very nice, but what can we say about it? We can just say, well, that's just the facts. I guess she was just telling them the facts. All right, well, how about another prophet? How about Nathan the prophet when he comes and talks to David? After David did the most despicable thing David ever did. That's according to the text. The text says that. When he seduced, had sex with, I'll, I'll say have sex with, but it's, I think it was more coarse than that. It deserves a more coarse word. His loyal captain's wife. And then he tried to cover it up. And he couldn't cover it up because his captain, Uriah, he was so loyal. So what did he do? He saw to it that Uriah was killed. Piece of shit move. The text itself tells us, piece of shit move, huge black mark on his life and, and the record of his life. So when this happens, now Yahweh alerts Nathan. Nobody else knows. Nobody. David knows. Bathsheba knows. I think Joab, David's captain, who was a real piece of work, Joab, I think he had a kind of an idea that something was amiss. But at this point, really just David and Bathsheba know. That's it. But Yahweh knew. And he tells Nathan. Nathan goes to see David. Now, does Nathan approach David in a kind of a soft way? You know, he doesn't want to be too harsh with him. But he's got to tell him the truth. Doesn't want to be harsh. He's got to tell him the truth. No, he does not. In fact, Nathan uses essentially an allegory, not, not for the purposes of a soft sell. Not for the purposes of a soft sell. He uses the allegory so that he can illustrate to David how wrong and pathetic and vulgar and loathsome and dark what he did was. He is not soft selling. So in 2 Samuel 12, starting with the first verse, I'm going to read through this. It's not many verses, but this is important. It says, And Yahweh sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own meat and drank of his own cup. It lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, 
and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against this man. And he said to Nathan, As Yahweh lives, the man that's done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus saith Yahweh, Alim of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you, your master's house, and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And, if that had been too little, I would moreover, I've given you unto these such and such things, I would have given you more. That's what Yahweh's saying. I would have given you more, if that wasn't enough. Wherefore, or how, have you despised the commandment of Yahweh to do evil in his sight, You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be your wife and have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. You've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I'll raise up evil against you out of your own house. I'll take your wives from before your eyes. I'll give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly. Had Uriah killed and fucked his wife. He did it secretly. But I'll do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I've sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, Yahweh also hath put away thy sin, and you will not die. Howbeit, because this deed that you have given great occasion to the enemies of Yahweh, because you've done this, and because all this will befall you, you've given great occasion to the enemies of Yahweh, to blaspheme, to slander. All David brought all that wickedness because he had to fuck someone's wife. So Nathan tells him, the child also that's born unto you shall die. And the child did die. <laughs> so yeah, Uriah comes to him with essentially, we could say, not a parable, an allegory, a metaphor, to get David's blood up, to piss him off. Because David still had a sense of righteousness and fair play. It's just that David was remarkably selfish. And in fact, because David had all that guilt of these selfish things that he did, he probably hated this man in this story ten times more. Then Nathan revealed to him that it's you. You're the one. See, David didn't know that anyone knew. David had to know that Yahweh knew, whether he was putting that out of his mind or not. Nathan didn't soft sell him. And then Nathan came back with more words of Yahweh. Harder words. Harder words. It wasn't all things... Now, we see that in verse 13. You won't die. That's the bright side. That's the only bright side. But there's a dark side to all of this. Because David was made king, he, and he was king, and he misused the office of king for the sake of his dick. That's why. Folks, if you're a little sensitive because of his dick. He didn't follow goodness, decency. He didn't respect what he was given. 
but he misused it. And now he caused occasion for the enemies of Yahweh to blaspheme, to slander. So that also comes out of Nathan's mouth. And then what? That the child that you've impregnated Bathsheba with, it's going to die. That happened too. Solomon was the second. <clears throat> But here's the thing, David was, besides that, besides that awful thing, David was righteous. He had a pattern of being righteous throughout his life. He did this thing, this terrible thing. So he understood. He fully understood. If Nathan had gone to Saul, let's say Saul, I don't think anything that Nathan would have said, no matter if it would have been nice and flowery. Now, some of us who are familiar with 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, we're familiar with the dealings that Samuel had with Saul. They were a nightmare. It was a living nightmare. It didn't add, wouldn't have mattered how Samuel talked to Saul. Saul was bent and determined on doing things Saul's way. I would say Nathan's approach here was crass, it was clever, and it was brutal because he deliberately worked David up into a great state of anger and then put his life, Nathan, put his life in his own hands by commencing judgment upon him. Now, yeah, maybe Nathan knew that David was not going to imprison him or kill him, because he knew that David was actually righteous, except in this matter. But, if he was willing to kill Uriah, there might have been a certain amount of risk, but Nathan went. Nathan went and did what Yahweh told Nathan to go and do. And his approach was, I guarantee you, exactly the way that Yahweh told him to go and approach it. Now, for this example, I'm really going to have to read the whole chapter. There's no way around it. I'd like to give you background on it, but it's ten verses of background, so might as well read the whole thing. I think this is a very good illustration of, first off, the approach of the prophets. Is it soft? Can be some. It can be. Who are we talking to? Are we talking to somebody who's righteous? Who's just faltered? Or are we talking about somebody who really needs to hear some very plain, sometimes harsh words. And we're not even getting into the worst of it. We're not even getting into the worst of it. But this is going to be a very good illustration of how serious Yahweh is about obedience and about responsibility. Everybody has responsibility, whether you think you do or not. I don't care if the state has raised you thinking that you don't have responsibilities other than going to your slave job and paying them taxes. You have responsibilities over and above that. So in 1 Kings chapter 13, starting at verse 1, this is right after Jeroboam was appointed king of Israel, and he is immediately really messing up. Like, like Saul-style messing up, maybe even worse. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of Yahweh unto Bethel. That means he told him to go. All right? And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now, I don't know what we're looking at with these words Mezabah, that's, that's translated altar and all that stuff. We're just going to have to, to a degree, just assume some of this is correct. Who knows? We're going to get the basics and the spirit of what we're being relayed here. And he cried against the altar in the word of Yahweh and said, O altar, altar, thus say Yahweh, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. He's prophesying of a king that wasn't born until centuries later. Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests 
of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon you. And that's what Josiah did, according to the translations and text. Hundreds of years later. Now this guy's a prophet, and he's talking about things that are going to happen far, far, far into the future. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which Yahweh has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard that saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. Because, you know, prophets often took their lives and safety and freedom in their hands to do what Yahweh tells them to do. Prophets sacrifice. They do. And this guy went a little bit further than just taking his life in his hand with Jeroboam, as we'll see. Now, Jeroboam said he took his hand from the Mezbach altar, maybe, and he said, lay hold on him. And his hand, Jeroboam's hand, which he put forth, pointing at him, obviously, I would think, it dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. So, I would imagine drying up, it seized up. His hand seized up. Went crippled. The, also, the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of Yahweh. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of Yahweh, Aleik, your God, not our God, not Aleinu, our God, is your God. That's what Saul said all the time to Sam, your God. And pray for me, the guy who had said, the Jeroboam, the guy who had just said, seize him. Now his hand seized up. Pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought Yahweh. Can you believe it? And the king's hand was restored to him again and became as it was before. I guess it was just an object lesson. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. He was probably pretty shaken. The man of God said to the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of Yahweh, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that you came. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Keep that in mind. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. And I'm not so sure about all that. So, so they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Out thou the man, out th Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of Yahweh, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that you came. And he said to him, the old man, said to him, I am a prophet also, as you are. And an angel spake unto me by the word of Yahweh, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. That prophet, who was a prophet, lied to that prophet who was a prophet. 
Why? We saw it in Deuteronomy 13. When Yahweh said, I'll test you. Now, this guy, there should have been at least an issue between the man from Judah who was sent to Bethel and this guy. Let's just say that. There should have been at that point in time when he told him, I'm a prophet too, and an angel told me to do this. The guy should have thought, but has Yahweh told me? Yahweh specifically directly told the man to go to Bethel and prophesy against Jeroboam. Now all of a sudden some guy comes. He doesn't know this guy. He doesn't know this guy. That guy could have been some rando whoever. He could have been a family member of Jeroboam that heard what the guy said to Jeroboam and thought, let me see if I can entice this guy and get him caught up. He doesn't, he doesn't know who this guy is. But he says, the prophet lied to him. Well, funny thing is, keep this in mind, prophets of Yahweh are allowed to do that. Anyone who tells you that lying is always bad and we should never regard it as being okay, that's not true. You have to contextualize all of this. So it continues in 19, So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of Yahweh came unto the prophet that brought him back, the old man. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of Yahweh, and hast not kept the commandment which Yahweh, Alaik, commanded you, but you came back, eat bread, and drank water in the place of which Yahweh did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of your fathers, which we would have to assume was back in Judah. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, after he had drank, that he saddled for him the ass, if you say so, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back. So he got him ready to go. He had ate, he had drank. The guy told him, you weren't supposed to do that. He should not have listened. And he got him ready to go. And it says, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. Maybe it was a lion. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass, maybe it was an ass, stood by it. And the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. I don't think men had passed by a lion standing over the carcass of a... Uh, anyways. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard, he said, Is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of Yahweh? Therefore, Yahweh hath delivered him unto the lion. Probably Ari. Unless it's, because like, there's like four words translated as lion. Which hath torn him and slain him, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Ugh, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way. And the ass and the lion standing by the car. Really? He found the ass and the lion standing there, and he was like, Ah, oh, this lion's okay. He's not going to touch me. He's fine. He's fine. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And, and the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back to the old prophet. Oh, sorry. Brought it back, and the old prophet came into the city to mourn and bury him. He mourned him, the old prophet. The old prophet was just going and testing him, because Yahweh told him to go. He lied to him because he was there to test him. Now, we don't know the history of this man of God, this prophet of Judah, that came to Jeroboam. And he came to Jeroboam. What did he do? He 
delivered a prophecy, an accurate one, a very accurate prophecy, hundreds of years into the future. And he also, when Jeroboam was going to seize him, Yahweh seized up Jeroboam, Jeroboam's hand, maybe his arm too, and that same man, he prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh unseized his arm, hand, whatever he had done to him. We're talking about a prophet, a prophet who Yahweh told, don't eat, nor drink, don't come back the way you came. He was very particular. And for whatever reason, Yahweh tells another prophet to go and lie to him. He should have never listened to him. At best, maybe, he should have just thanked him and said, I'm sorry, you are mistaken. Or, Yahweh didn't say that to me. And went on his way, a different way just like he was told. Now that's quite an approach. And by the way, this old prophet buried him, buried him in a special plot and instructed his sons, this old prophet, when I die, bury me next to him. Because he mourned for him. He was mourning. But he did what he was told. And it probably hurt him very much because of the tragedy of it. It hurt him. And he respected this man. And of course, he didn't, not that we know of, he didn't have any kind of special knowledge of, of, of what may have been the, 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 the character flaw that this man carried around that he finally succumbed to there. He may not have even known that. All he knew is that he was not to be buried back in the sepulcher of his family's, uh, um, his own homeland, Judah. But there was nothing prohibiting him from burying him there in Bethel, and he told his sons when, when he dies to bury him next to this man, who he obviously respected. But he did what he was told, and he delivered a horrible judgment didn't flower it up, didn't soften it up. Neither did the first prophet to Jeroboam. Because that's not a prophet's calling, to soften things up, to sweeten things up. Not to the people, not to individuals, certainly not to kings, and definitely not to another prophet. Now, this video's ran for just about an hour, and the thing is, I know it's a briefs, and briefs is just a certain format. It's somewhat extemporaneous, sometimes spontaneous, but this one is actually going to have a couple few episodes because I want to talk a little bit more about prophets, their approach, maybe a bit about who they are, and instances regarding their approach, because if somebody should try that crap with you about it's your approach, change your approach. If you just had a softer approach, maybe other people, maybe I, would be more likely to listen to the truth. To the truth. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you could say that this is anecdotal if you want, but I almost wouldn't care what the approach of someone was if they were telling the truth. They could have a, a quiet, reserved personality. And when they deliver the truth, it might be in the same vein as that quiet, reserved personality of theirs. Maybe. Maybe they have a loud, brash personality, and that's the way they deliver the truth. Maybe they have a quiet personality, and when they deliver the truth, it's very loud and brash, and it's coarse. Truth is the truth. I hear the truth, and it's not very often anymore that I do. 
but I hear the truth and I respond to that truth. I do not worry about the delivery of that person giving me the truth because I feel like now I am being, what's the word? Lucky, blessed, like I'm being given a great gift. I'm not going to worry about the approach of this person if they're giving me the truth. If they're not bullshitting me and they're giving me the truth, I'm not going to worry about those other things. So the people who are worried about those other things and come up with all kinds of excuses for why it's not good enough, and it has nothing to do with evidence. It has everything to do with these secondaries, these tertiaries, these minors. Those are people who just don't want the truth. Those are the people who are like the majority of Israel, the majority of Judah. We're not just talking about the little folks. We're talking about the kings too, and sometimes even the, pro even the prophets. So I'm going to wrap that and then I'm just going to pick up again with another episode of this talking about the prophets and their approach. And is that what we should focus on? I didn't like their approach. They used cuss words. They yelled a lot. They yelled. Can you believe that? They yelled. Well, we'll look at it more next time. So I'll see those of you who have joined me in the next one. Take care.